Thank you, Bertie, and welcome everybody to the Climate Emergency Advisory Committee. Today is Monday the 27th of March and uh, in this committee then we discuss all things related to climate emergency, how we can progress things forward from a veil perspective and can and uh, have a positive contribution to the environment via our policies, procedures and things we can influence. And we make recommendations to the cabinet who implement some of our ideas. Um, the first thing on the agenda is apologies for absence. Candida, do we have any apologies? We've had um, apologies from Councillor Eric Batts. Thank you. The second item on the agenda is declarations of interest. Do any members of the committee have any declarations of interest? No, I'm just seeing shaking heads. That's fine. Third item on the agenda is urgent business. There is no urgent business. Agenda item number four is chair's announcements. I just had a couple of things I wanted to mention. So um, the first thing is, I was going to mention this at the welcome. Um, we are having this meeting in the daylight where daylight savings time has just started. And for those, yeah, it's great. Those who didn't know, it was originally brought in to save energy. So um, as a measurement by the government to have more of us um, making use of the daylight instead of being asleep while it was light in the morning and then having to use energy to light um, in the evening when we wanted to work or play. So I thought that was quite relevant for this committee. Um, the second thing I wanted to mention was that in a previous um, meeting, uh, Councillor Jenner had asked um, about um, uh, having somebody called Catriona Bay speak about meadow creation. Um, one of our officers has kindly looked into this and um, has found an event that we can attend sort of outside of the meeting that would be much more in depth um, rather than what we could cover in reasonably in a meeting like this. So I have a link for that which I can um, I can share with members should they be interested. And then finally to mention that this will be um, plan to be the last meeting before we have um, the election. So people watching and certainly the members on the committee will know that we have an election at the beginning of May. So um, this committee may have some different people in it um, come May. So this is the last time that this particular group of people is meeting. And I just want to use that time to thank everybody uh, for their contributions while we've had the Climate Emergency Advisory Committee. It's something that um, was new for this administration in the past four years. So it was great to have um, this, this new committee that was created and these group of people um, contributing it. So thank you to every member of the committee, um, past and present. And the fifth item on the agenda is the minutes of the last meeting. Uh, can we agree the minutes of the last meeting as a correct record? Agreed. Thank you. Agreed. Okay. Um, the sixth item on the agenda is public participation. And today we do have a member of the public uh, who has come to speak to us, which is great to have the public engaging with the council um, and particularly uh, to do with the climate. So if we could have our speaker, um, I can see he's on the call. If you can, can you hear us? I can hear you, can you hear me? We can hear you. Is it possible to turn your camera on so we may see you as well? I, I can't unfortunately apologies. No I'm problem. No problem. Phone, we can so. hear you and that's that's the main thing. So um then yes, please go ahead. Sam. Brilliant, thanks. Um so uh, I've got a question to ask. Uh, my question is regarding one of the council schemes, which is actually referenced in the uh, quarterly performance report on the agenda. Um and, and that is the council's plans to develop land within Great Western Park, Didcot, from its approved use as a wildflower meadow into the council's new grounds maintenance depot. Um, for those who aren't aware, the land in question is part of a master planned residential development. Um, it is designated public open space and the developers are on the hook to deliver the wildflower meadow as part of the measures to compensate for the biodiversity harm caused by the wider 
development. Um, the approved planting and management details are consistent with the definition of a lowland meadow, a habitat of principal importance to biodiversity. And as per the biodiversity metric tool, in any ordinary circumstances, any loss of this habitat would be deemed unacceptable. Uh, the district councils have attempted to justify the scheme by claiming it will help to reduce distances travelled by grounds maintenance teams. Uh, a valid argument for locating the depot in the vicinity of Didcot, perhaps on one of the numerous nearby industrial estates, but not an excuse to displace a wildflower meadow in the process. Uh, now documents obtained by a Freedom of Information request have confirmed what residents suspected, that the real reason this site was selected over alternatives is because, being public open space, ownership of the land will be transferred to Vale by the developers and the council can therefore use it rent free. So it seems the council's stated aims to address the climate emergency and specifically to enhance biodiversity on the lands they own are only good until they see an opportunity to stop paying rent on an industrial unit, at which point they won't hesitate to tarmac over whatever wildflower meadow stands in their way. Residents were pleased to see the initial planning application withdrawn, uh, but disappointed to hear in the last few weeks that the councils are pressing ahead regardless with their plans to develop this site. If this land, as a reminder, is in the Vale, ownership will be transferred to the Vale, the depot will be used by the Vale, and documents suggest even though the application was submitted in the name of South Oxfordshire District Council, it was Vale which paid for both the planning application and the planning agent's fees. Ultimately, the decision to continue pursuing this scheme sits with the Vale as a policy matter. So my question is, insofar as this committee exists to review and make recommendations to the Cabinet on how the Council can reduce their damage to the environment, is this committee supportive of the Council's scheme to tarmac over a wildflower meadow? And if not, what steps will the committee take to protect this important habitat from development? Thank you. Thank you um, to the public speaker, John Sammons. Um, appreciate you um, bringing this to, um, to our committee. Um, I know that, so we have uh, Councillor Sally Pawlowski uh, here with us this evening, who is the cabinet member for climate and the portfolio holder for the um, for the item in question that you have mentioned. So if I could have Councillor Pawlowski to give a response, please. Thanks, Ailey, and uh, thank you, Mr. Summon, for coming to speak to us. Um, we've exchanged emails um, on this subject um, previously. Um, so South Oxfordshire District Council made a planning application to use part of a site, which is currently used by construction firms. As you know, it's the sort of base zero really for Taylor Wimpy and it has been for the last what 18 to 20 years um, as a location for the council shared grounds maintenance team. As the land is in the Vale, the Vale of Whitehorse District Council was acting in its capacity as a planning authority and therefore had to remain impartial, which is why South Oxford District Council made the application. We understand that, uh, I'm just going to call it SODC, everyone here knows what that means, uh, was concerned about the misinformation that was circulating amongst the local community and in the local media, and it withdrew its application to engage more widely with the local community to ensure the reasons for choosing the site were very clear. Um, I understand that one of those reasons is that the central location of the site means much uh, reduced mileage for the vehicles, which obviously will be on our uh, policy part to head towards zero emissions anyway, and also reduced carbon emissions um, due to the amount of activity there will need to be on uh, Great Western Park and obviously the future for Valley Park just next door. As a proposed facility will serve both South and Vale, it would ensure affected Vale residents are communicated with as well before any new plans are submitted. Um, and one of the things that we discussed uh, on our emails, uh, Mr Salmon, was around actually what certainly I would see the vision for that site is uh, beyond kind of what has been communicated already and the original plans that were put in, which, you know, it needs to go a lot further and do a lot more for the community. Um, I do know that an ecological assessment was submitted with the withdrawn application. 
and expect to see that any further application would set out details for any ecological mitigation and biodiversity net gain. As you mentioned earlier with um, you know, the, the DEFRA metrics, you know, that is an essential part of planning now. And we would work to ensure that this means any land set aside for biodiversity features in earlier proposals would be more than offset by additional planting and schemes nearby. We would expect any future application to detail the need for or benefit um, of the um, maintenance yard to be located at this site. But as mentioned, um, currently there is no active planning application uh, for this site and more than happy to continue communicating accordingly. Thank you very much. Thank you, um, Councillor Pawlowski, for the response to the question. That will obviously also be published in the minutes, which I think um, the public speaker will agree that um, as it should be so that, you know, everybody can see this information and it's, you know, it is our aim as a committee, as a council to be transparent about this and um, hold our hands up and say, yeah, we need to be um, have open communication with the residents that we serve. So. Um, thank you for, for bringing this to um, a public meeting um, for us to give a response. OK, so that brings us on to the next agenda item, uh, agenda item seven, uh, update from the Cabinet member. So, um, Councillor Pawlowski, back to you. Uh, thank you very much and um, thank you, uh, committee and chair. So um, things have been going on since we last met. So we've had the Future Oxfordshire Partnership, FOP, Environmental Advisory Group. Last meeting took place uh, earlier in March and the main item of discussion was the Oxford, bleh, Oxfordshire Net Zero Route Map. All these things have too many words and action plan, uh, which we'll be looking at obviously later in the agenda with the team. Uh, there was also discussion about what the EAG could do to help inform the current debate around the location of ground mounted solar farms, which uh, we have um, lots of applications for. Um, and further work is required to scope out what needs to be done. And this will be brought back to a future meeting of EAG for discussion. So hopefully, Chair, it's something this group can uh, look at going forwards around the um Obviously, the need to get to zero carbon, but also you know, the need for renewables and actually what does that mean to our countryside and our land? Waste. So as you get the trumpets out, once again, Vale of White Horses have come forth in the league table uh, for household recycling, uh, with our colleagues at South retaining their second place. Uh, meanwhile, obviously, the waste team is looking at all options for future services, and I'm sure that SEAC will be involved with all that soon. I wish I had better news uh, on the environment bill, wherever it is. It feels a bit like, where's Wally? If anyone can find it, that would be great. Direct it back down. Um, and its measurements coming to play. But so far, silence is pretty deafening and everybody everywhere is asking lots of questions. Energy, following a successful bid to the public sector decarbonisation scheme and the award of £5.99 million pounds, uh, for works to Wantage Leisure Centre and the White Horse Tennis and Leisure Centre. And big, big well done to the team for getting that in. Um, we have now started work looking at our other buildings uh, with a contract to be awarded for site decarbonisation assessments for Abbey Meadows Pool and the Beacon. These assessments will determine what works are required to decarbonise those buildings and will inform the evidence required to make future funding bids to the public sector decarbonisation scheme. Uh, the Council have appointed APSE Energy to undertake a feasibility study into investing into solar energy on council land with an aim to offset the council's unavoidable carbon emissions. The report will include a financial model as well as contractual planning and grid supply issues, and that will be fed into future decisions around investment. Climate Action Fund 2022-23, so the one that's just closed now for financial year, um, a total of £42,835 was awarded to 15 organisations across the Vale to support projects uh, uh, taking climate action. Um, and as many of you know, I'm I'm totally pro grassroots up, so I love the Climate Action Fund, it's really exciting. Um, following, obviously, the successful allocation of funds in 21-22, um, and 22-23 officers have initiated a review of the previous CAF fund rounds in order to prepare for launching the next round of funding, which will benefit from an increased allocation, thanks to our chair uh, pushing that at the last council, of £100,000. Uh, so really, really exciting. I had a really great meeting with officers about that the other day with the leader of the council. Um, also, we had a chat about comms and I've asked if the climate um, team could also start looking at building plans for a green focused newsletter monthly for all of our wonderful Vale based sustainability and environmental groups to share best practices and ideas, tips and ways of getting around things. Lots of people are doing lots of good things and we need to share that everywhere. And we should be hugely proud of our ecosystem of climate champions in the Vale. I know I certainly am. 
a bid to the net zero fast followers fund i swear dominic has just given me like the most abbreviation word heavy uh, bit so another another one there i don't know what that abbreviates to uh, officers submitted a funding application to the net zero living fast followers program uh, if the bid is successful this project will fund an officer post and a consultant to support develop the development of an approach to investment in nature-based carbon offsetting in oxfordshire aiming to offer oxfordshire's businesses and local authorities opportunities to invest in nature-based carbon sequestering schemes within the county south oxfordshire are leading the bid uh, with Vale of White Horse, um, District Council, Cherwell, West Oxfordshire and the Oxfordshire Local Nature Partnership as all as project partners. Levi, so the Local um, Electric Vehicle Infrastructure Fund, the Office for Zero Emission Vehicles has awarded £700,000 from the pilot Levi scheme, not the jeans. Uh, we were previously unsuccessful with OZEV wanting to level up in other areas. Uh, so the money will be used across the county to fund cable gullies. So these are where we provide um, off street park, the people who don't have off street park in a way to be able to charge without anyone tripping over cables, um, enabling the residents to um, charge their electric vehicles on the streets which will be great there's a few of these already in oxford you can hunt them down if you want to go and have a look uh, nature recovery officers in the net climate and biodiversity team have worked with the parks and comms team to develop let it be everyone can sing a song let it be project which aims to promote uh, wildlife friendly management of council-owned land this follows on from Nomo May trials, which ran across the last growing season, um, and it involves a total of nine sites covering around 51,000 square metres, where the grasses will be left to grow for the benefit of wildlife. The sites are spread across Abingdon, Farringdon and Wantage. There's a really great page on our um, website, which um, I've shared the link with before, I think. Um, in addition, we've also created a new wildflower meadow at Herons Walk in Abingdon, where the grass was um, scarified down and a wildflower mix has been sown and subsequently massively snowed and watered in. So I have my fingers crossed for the germination of that one. Uh, all the sites will be monitored this summer to determine how successful the approach is in both terms of wildlife benefit, costs and public perception. Um, there will be some signage going up on these sites um, and the comms team have been working with local schools to design those signs. There's a really nice sort of community effort there. And meanwhile, just um, going off on a bit of a sobering thought, um, the IPCC, so the um, International Panel for Climate Change, has basically given us our final warning on climate crisis. It's been eight years in the penning, but boiled down to one simple message. Act now or it will be too late. Ho Sung Lee, the chair of the IPC, said the synthesis report underscores the urgency of taking more ambitious action. And it shows that if we do act now, we can still secure a livable, sustainable future for all. I hope as I close this statement um, as your um, cabinet member for climate before our elections in May, those who continue into the new administration do so with a gusto on climate. The latest report is a survival guide for humanity, and it does show that the 1.5 degree limit is achievable, but it also means some huge and sometimes really difficult decisions need to be made. And I just wanted to thank everyone for having me here for the last 12 months and wish you all the best in the coming weeks. Thank you, Chair. Thank you to our Cabinet Member for Climate, Councillor Sally Pobolotsky, for that update and for, for your work uh, in the role um, for the elections. Are there any um, questions from our members uh, for the Cabinet Member on any of the items that she just mentioned? I can't see. Oh, OK. Yep. Yeah, Councillor Grant. Thanks. I, I hadn't heard of that gully thing before. I'm just I quickly Googled it to take a look of a picture. So it's just like a, a um, basically a, a little slot in the pavement that you can go under. So, so does that require the change a change in the parking rule? So only that person can park outside their front on that in front of their house in their street or something like that as well. You mean you're charging, David? Let's not all hog a space. I mean, so um, there are a few at the moment in central Oxford. Um, I think, Dominic, I might get this wrong. They're in Jericho, I think, somewhere near. Uh, I think some of them are around that area. Yeah. yeah. Um, at least fundamentally, it's a public safety issue because you can't have yeah. cables trailing across the pavement. Um, but I don't think they are linked to residents parking currently. No, they're so not. So obviously, the the idea is obviously you can have one run, uh, you know, near your home, uh, and obviously 
be able to plug in at the other end it's still your cable and it's still removable so it's not a permanent cable that's left in um but obviously if you're not there or you're out using your car then somebody else can use that, that space so it's not it's I think there would be a very large cost from Oxfordshire County Council if we started designated bits of road uh, to specific residents. Uh, but hopefully, yeah, so far it seems to be working. So um, if you want to drop me an email, David, I can put you in touch with the um, councillor who's got it in his uh, division at county, because actually it's been really successful so far. Um, and lots of very happy people. And no one's tripped over and broke the neck, which is always good. Uh, so, um, so yeah, and it's quite a nice, simple little, little piece of civil engineering. So. Yeah, it's really yeah. good. Thanks. Great. Thanks both. Uh, Councillor Dillahart. You're just oh, on yeah. mute. <laughs> yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, I just had a question for Councillor Pavlovsky. Um, in, with, in, in France, they've decreed that um, all parking lots must, above a certain size must be covered in, in solar panels, which sounds like a good idea to me. I just wanted to know if we are considering that because we own a few parking lots. So um, obviously that comes under technical services. Um, so more than happy to take that up on that side there. There is um, some redevelopment going on currently with our um, car parks that we have. Um, we're focusing more around green and blue infrastructure on those. If you have a look at the car parks that they have been doing in France, they're of a much vaster scale than I think any of the landscape we currently have. However, there is lots of discussions going on at the county council, I know with members there, around that schools, so where schools have car parks, obviously for staff, etc., that we should think about, you know, any new school has a solar panelled covered car park um, so that obviously there's there's infrastructure there especially for rural schools for charging uh, and maybe in other areas but currently there's no plan um, I don't even have any funding that would do that yet either um, Councillor Dillahart but it's it's certainly I think utilising infrastructure more for for generation of energy needs to happen and I think this EAG kind of discussion around solar and solar energy and hopefully something that you could look at further down the road I think we've got plenty of roofs to occupy first and Dominic, do you want to come in there? Yeah, yeah. So um, just picking up on that, um, what one of the uh, pieces of work we've just commissioned is some work to look at the potential for ground mounted solar on land that the council owns. And that's by an organisation called APSI Energy, who, which we're members of. Um, so part of that commission is to look at the feasibility of a car park. Um, so we're going to look at it and see what are the pros and cons, costs and benefits and so on. Um, and that will hopefully help inform what we might want to do going forward. So that's sort of um, sort of what we're looking at for the future. Thanks. I'd imagine, Dominic, one of the... What we've lost, Sally? Sorry. Uh, sorry, so uh, um, one of the issues that I guess would come up is currently none of the car parks I'm aware of have height restrictions because none of them have barriers. So obviously, I think the car parks I've seen in France are very much just car car parks and not vans and trucks, etc. And um, especially in our market town, some of our car parks are used quite a lot by the market traders. Mm, yeah, lots to look into there. OK, um, Councillor Weber, did you have a question? Uh, well, actually, I, my question has been asked because I was going to mention that about car parks. Um, and that's what, something I was quite keen on, as well as playgrounds. So, so I think I've been given a very full answer. But I would like to just congratulate um, that report. It was really exciting, all the stuff that's happening. Um, and uh, I just feel that we are well on the way of uh, getting our, some of our targets uh, fulfilled. So I just would like to say well done all. Thank you. Thank you, Catherine. And if I, if I could just say to that, Councillor Weber, I think we're very, very lucky that there's been an investment in the climate team um, and that investment is growing um, and that the priority this council sees on the investment in climate to yeah, help us with our targets and make us a better council. Um, and, you know, I think it's it's really, really exciting. And I'm, I'm really pleased to see that we've gone for some more funding for more help, more staff, because as you well know, Councillor Weber, there's nothing coming down from central government to help us on this one. So um, I think the investment in our, our funding officer and our, our, our sort of uh, loans application officer has been a, a, a very, very beneficial one so far. So, um, so yeah, just well done to everybody. It's yeah. growing and it needs to keep growing. 
I have to say that I'm quite envious that you've had all these officers working on the, on climate. It looks really good, the amount of work that they've done. So, so well done all. <laughs> right. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. And thanks again, um, Sally, for that one. Thank you, Chair. So, if it's OK with you, I'm going to leave you for the evening. So yeah. thank you very much. Thanks for having me, everyone. Take care. Thanks, Sally. Bye. Thank you. Great. OK, then the next agenda item number eight is our, the Environment Act update, which is a standing agenda item. Um, Dominic, do you have a update on I do, the Environment yes. Act? Despite what Sally says, there is something to update you on this time. So uh, I'll just share my screen if you bear with me. Yeah. Right, hopefully you can all see my screen. Yep, I can see. Yeah. Excellent. OK, so um, yes, despite what Sally said, actually, there has been there have been a few updates um, since our last meeting on the Environment Act. Um, so you'll remember, obviously, the Act was published in November 2021. And uh, since that time, fundamentally, we've been waiting for um, guidance and uh, regulations to be released by the government, um, which will set out exactly how they want elements of the Act implemented. Um, now, the first uh, of the guide, or oh, sorry, the first of the uh, updates I've got to give you, um, if I can get my slides to move on, so just bear with me, there we go, um, is that at the end of uh, February, just gone, the government has finally published its response to the biodiversity net gain consultation. Now, the consultation was actually launched in January last year, and it's taken nearly a year to get the consultation response. Now, that probably is an indication of how significant the changes around biodiversity net gain are for local authorities. It, it has quite far reaching and uh, significant implications in terms of the way we do our jobs in the local planning authority and for the environment and for developers. So possibly rightly, it's taken quite a long time to come out with a response, but I'm, I'm not here to, to, to explain why the government's taken quite so long, I must admit. That's not the purpose of this. Anyway, so um, now this isn't obviously the guidance and legislation, but what it does do, it gives a very clear steer as to where the guidance and legislation are going to go. So what I've tried to do here is summarise some of the key issues that are likely to affect the Vale as a local planning authority. Um, so firstly, it clarifies um, the types of application that are likely to be in scope for biodiversity net gain um, and those that are likely to be excluded, in fact, uh, which is what I meant to say. Um, so firstly, it clarifies that householder applications are going to be excluded from the requirement to demonstrate 10% net gain. So these are all of the sort of small scale extensions, alterations to buildings and so on. Now, given that those type of applications, generally speaking, have a very minor, if any, impact on biodiversity, it's probably reasonable that they're excluded from the requirement. Um, Secondly, development that's below a de minimis threshold of 25 square metres for in area or five square metres of sort of any linear feature is excluded from the from the requirements um, for much the same reason. Biodiversity net gain sites are excluded from having to deliver 10 percent net gain. Now, that seems a bit odd and you might need that one explained. But in essence, if you are, have a development that has a requirement to deliver 10 percent net gain and you can't do that on site, that means you have to actively create a habitat elsewhere. Some types of habitat creation, for example, creating wetlands require planning permission. So this is just to ensure that if you're creating a wetland to deliver biodiversity net gain on a development site, you don't have to deliver 10% net gain on that as well. So it's, it does sort of make sense when you think about it. And uh, finally, small scale self build sites are excluded from the requirement to deliver 10% net gain because the government wants to promote uh, self build as a way of improving the quality of development in the country. 
Um, they will at some point be defining what small scale actually is, because that's not clear from the um, from where we are at the moment. Um, so um, net gain will be implemented from November 2023 for major development sites. Now, in the Vale, in practice, we've had planning policies that require net gain to be delivered on major development sites. So that's a site of more than 10 housing units or more than 1,000 metres squared in area uh, for quite some time for the whole of the period of the last local plan. So that won't be a significant change for us, but there will be a significant change in terms of the amount of information we have to collect and retain as part of the new requirements in the Environment Act. So there will be quite a bit of ramping up even to get to November 23 for us. But luckily, we are quite ahead of the game compared to a lot of the rest of the country in this area. So we're in a good place. What they have done in recognition of the significant changes that biodiversity net gain do require in the planning system is extend the deadline for all other in scope applications to April 2024. So this is there's going to be an awful lot more applications we will be assessing for biodiversity net gain compared to what we do currently. Um, a bit of a sort of a uh, rough and ready calculation I did a couple of years ago suggests that that's going to be about a thousand percent increase in the number of consultations that our ecologists in the planning team receive. So there's quite a bit of um, sort of uh, building up of capacity we're going to need to do to make sure we're ready for that April 24 date. Um, this isn't national infrastructure projects are so something that we as a local authority don't determine, but it's important. And I thought you'd be interested to know that national infrastructure projects will be subject to biodiversity net gain, 10 percent net gain from November 2025. Those of you that read the consultation may remember that there were suggestions that they might be exempt or they would perhaps be subject to a smaller level of net gain. Thankfully, the government is holding itself to task and saying, well, no, all of these sites should be subject to 10% net gain. But in recognition of the fact that these projects are often very complicated and large scale, the date of implementation of that won't come in until November 2025. And Natural England, it's been confirmed, will operate the biodiversity, ugh, excuse me, biodiversity gain site register. So this is a national statutory register. So when biodiversity net gains are delivered off site, so not on your development site, all of those will have to be put on this register and linked back to a development. So there will be a publicly available register which you can look on to see where all of the gains that are being delivered are being done. Um, the other element of this that is it's been confirmed that Natural England will also be the supplier of last resort for biodiversity credits. So biodiversity credits are what a developer would need to buy if they can't deliver their 10 percent net gain on their development site. Now, um, there's been a concern for some time that um, there could be a bottleneck when this thing is introduced because the local markets that are selling these biodiversity net gain credits don't yet exist. Now in Oxfordshire we are again slightly ahead of the game because we have a couple of organisations which do sell credits but they are quite small scale and need to be ramped up significantly. So to prevent this bottleneck Natural England will be the supplier of last resort. The implications of that however are that Though any uh, credits uh, bought from Natural England almost certainly won't be delivered in Oxfordshire. They could be delivered anywhere in England. So it might be for peatland restoration in the Peak District, for example. You can't guarantee it will be local. But to try and incentivise the development of local markets, the government has said it will set the value of those credits that it sells at a very high level so that it incentivizes cheaper local solutions um, and in the long run they're looking for this isn't designed to be a scheme that runs for the long run it's something that will only happen for a couple of years until the local markets are up and running so the second piece of news um, on the environment act is related to local nature recovery strategies that's one of the key requirements of the act and it sets out how in Oxfordshire we will try and seek to reverse the decline in nature. So um, 
Oxfordshire County Council has provisionally agreed to be the responsible body for producing the Oxfordshire Local Nature Recovery Strategy. Um, the government has said that the uh, or it effectively appoints the responsible bodies and it said it can't be a district council level. So uh, we already knew it was going to be a county led strategy. To try and get ahead of the game, uh, the county has established a steering group, which first met in January this year, which has representatives from the county council, the Oxfordshire Local Nature Partnerships, the National Landscape, so that's the AOMBs, uh, the Forestry Commission, Natural England, the Environment Agency, uh, represent, a representative of community groups and one of farmers and landowners and one for the environmental NGOs such as wildlife trusts and so on. And importantly for us, there is one representative for the Oxford District Councils. And I'm pleased to say that that will be me representing the district councils and the city councils in Oxfordshire to try and ensure that our interests are protected and maintained during the process of developing the local nature recovery strategy. Now, the steering group is really mainly to do with um, helping to develop the process and ensuring the project management is done properly. Um, the, the production of the strategy um, will be led by an officer who Oxfordshire County Council are currently trying to recruit. An advert went out last week and it will be subject to very extensive public consultation. So um, it's, it's what the public say and, and the, the evidence that will define what goes into this strategy. Um, the County Council has always also produced a provisional timeline, uh, which is setting sets out to launch the Oxfordshire Local Nature Discovery Strategy in October 2024. Now, just to bring us right up to date, I started writing this presentation last Wednesday and then last Thursday um, they actually produced the guidance and regulations which will underpin the um, local nature recovery strategy. So we actually have the first set of guidance and regulations now available. Now, um, rather surprisingly to me, uh, the guidance was only 20 pages long, so it's relatively digestible. Even more surprisingly, the regulations were also only 20 pages long, so were easy, relatively easily digestible. Um, I'm not going to attempt to tell you exactly what they say at this stage, because I've had a first read and I wouldn't want to get any of that wrong. But they do include a very useful structure chart, which I've reproduced here, which guides you through the process. So. In order to produce this strategy, the first thing that we will have to do is to map the areas that are of particular importance for biodiversity. To a large extent, we've actually already done this work because a lot of work was done as part of the process of developing the Oxfordshire Plan 2050. Now, some of you may remember that that process developed a, a draft nature recovery network map. So we actually did a lot of the mapping already as part of that process. Now, whilst we're not looking to repeat that process, it does mean that, that all that data has already been brought into one place and we will look to update that to ensure we have everything that's most current. The second step is to then look at what other things are happening. So what current initiatives there are to improve nature around the county and include those in the strategy. Um, the third step will be to describe the area and its biodiversity and importantly, think about what are the opportunities for recovering nature in our area. And this is where we'll really, really be looking to see how we can turn this, turn Oxfordshire and the Vale into a biodiverse area that's well linked and resilient to the impacts of climate change. Um, Step four is an important one because we will then have to agree the priorities and identify what potential measures we want to take to do something about those. <clears throat> um, now, the guidance and legislation steps out a number of steps for consultation. So these are statutory steps we would have to follow. And that includes um, steps where the district councils would have to agree a document prior to it going to a public consultation. Now, if for any reason 
I hadn't done my job properly and we objected to it, there is also the opportunity at that point to uh, appeal that decision or appeal um, the, the, the proposed strategy to the Secretary of State. So there is a sort of feedback mechanism we would need if it all went horribly wrong, but I, I wouldn't necessarily think that was going to be the case. Um, we would also have to map the areas of most importance. So the two things that will come out of this process is a local habitat map and a statement of biodiversity priorities, which will become the local nature recovery strategy. And that is the end of my relatively brief presentation. So I shall stop sharing my screen. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dominic, for that update. Great to have um, an actual update this time, as so many meetings have passed where um, we haven't had anything from the government um, side to pass on. Um, I can see a couple of hands. So, um, Councillor Weber. Oh, yes. Thank, thank you very much, Dominic. That really was very, very interesting. Um, one question I have is about the 10% biodiversity areas that the builders have to uh, make sure are in, uh, either on site or offset. Um, who is responsible for taking care of that once it's been uh, implemented? It's an issue I'm having at the moment in my own area in Marcham. So um, I just would, would like to know how that's going to be sorted out. Um, <clears throat> it depends on whether the net gain was being delivered on site as part of a development or yeah. off-site. So if it's on-site, yeah. it would be the developer's responsibility or the management company who they pass that to, and that would be secured through planning conditions or obligations. Um, if it's off-site, then it will be the responsibility of whoever it is that's delivering, so whoever takes the money. So if a farmer signs up to deliver that, they will be legally required um, through a planning obligation to deliver that habitat and maintain it for a period of 30 years. And we as a local planning authority have a duty to monitor that delivery and implementation. So what I was saying earlier about the burdens of um, this new process, they're quite significant because we are required to ensure not only that habitat is delivered, but it's maintained and managed appropriately for a period of 30 years after the original um, habitat creation. And, and that's particularly interesting, Dominic, because um, you just said that most of the sites will not be in Oxfordshire. So uh, that are the offsite, offset sites. Um, it's, no, so they in the ones that aren't delivered in Oxfordshire, obviously that will be the responsibility of Natural England. So this is where uh, developers have to go to Natural England as their provider of last resort. So that doesn't mean most of them will. Oh. Hopefully we want and, and our local plan policies in future will look to try and guide the majority of that net gain to be delivered within our districts or within the county. Um, if it's delivered outside of our area, clearly, then we have no control over that. But there, these are some grey areas where we really need the guidance and, legit and regulations to clarify what are the what are the what's the situation if it's delivered by Natural England rather than a local provider. Well, thank you very much. Thank you uh, for your question, Councillor. But um, Dominic, just to say, you're still showing your screen. So oh, you apologies. Just sorry. Yeah, it's a lovely picture of a yeah. flower. Um, <laughs> Councillor Grant. Hi, thank you very much, Dominic. That's a good, uh, pretty good update, and good to hear you're you're, you're going to be our representative on the uh, local nature recovery uh, group as well. Um, I had a uh, couple of questions. Um, the first one's kind of related to what uh, Catherine was just saying. So, um, the biodiversity credits. Is there an opportunity for us to set up a scheme locally or, or with Oxfordshire perhaps more um, widely at least um, so that developers could just pay into that and then that I guess would have a, a the benefit two benefits one is that we know the money is being spent locally and being spent on things that we actually believe it should be spent on uh, and also it might simplify the long-term um monitoring of the maintenance if it's all under one 
group that we'll actually we control anyway, um, then we can just monitor that, uh, obviously. So the simple answer to that is local authorities can set themselves up as providers of habitat banks for biodiversity net gain, but uh, there are rules around that because we would have to set up an independent separate trading body in order to do it um, because it would be um, a, a, essentially a commercial enterprise. Um, and clearly um, the monitoring of that would have to be done. We still have to do that, but yes, I'll take your point. It would be uh, something that would be simpler if we were managing it. Now, uh, there are a number of organisations in Oxfordshire. The Wildlife Trust, for example, have been doing some trials looking at setting up habitat banks. Now, clearly their intention would be to deliver those habitats within Oxfordshire. There is also an organisation called the Trust Structure Envi Oxfordshire's Environment that we worked with early on to help set that up, again, which is uh, delivering the habitats within Oxfordshire. So we are looking at a number of options as to how we can ensure that as much net gain as possible is retained, ideally within district, but certainly within the county. Um, and can can we recommend certain habitat banks to developers or is that no? <laughs> no. And what we, particularly if we were to set up our if <laughs> we can't do that because there's a there are legal implications of that. Yeah. Sure. Okay. Okay. Thanks for both of those um, questions. I'm wondering if that is um, with this being sort of a new um, area with with sort of forthcoming information whether it's something we could put for a, a future item potentially um you know whether we would you know maybe this committee could recommend to set up the body that you mentioned maybe you know we could discuss that offline or in a particular task and finish to see if that's something that would make sense um yeah so recommend that we push that for a, a future item um okay i still see david and catherine's hands but i assume they're just from oh no no okay yeah david you have another question uh just a quick one <clears throat> the 2025 deadline for the national infrastructure that you were talking about um is that a deadline when it's built or when the application goes in do you know presumably it's when the application goes i'm, I'm kind of thinking um abingdon reservoir for example um, um would so, that sorry, be your... national infrastructure projects um that i i don't know the answer to that again that's where regu i'm guessing it would be when the application was submitted to the secretary of state but that's purely a guess so i think again we need to wait for the regulations and guidance now now they have now the government have said firmly that they are looking to implement in november 23 um I think it won't be long now until we get more regulations and guidance. So I think we're going to get a quite a lot of these things over the coming months. So there will be a lot to update on as we move forward. Okay, good question. Thank you. And yeah, thank you for that item, Dominic. Okay, that brings us on to agenda item number nine, which is the Oxfordshire Net Zero route map and action plan. And we have um, Jessie to introduce that item. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm just going to share my screen two seconds. So hopefully you can all see that. Um, yeah, I'm Jessie Feith. I'm one of the senior climate action officers in the climate and biodiversity team. And I'm just going to talk really briefly today about the Oxfordshire Net Zero Route Map and Action Plan. This has been finalised and was reviewed and endorsed by the Future Oxfordshire Partnership last week on the 20th of March. Uh, we have discussed the content of it at a previous SEAC meeting before. Um, and today, SEAC members are asked to review the document and provide any comments or recommendations to the Climate Emergency Cabinet member. The document is also going to go to Cabinet briefing on the 28th of April. Just to give a little bit of a reminder, city science uh, consultants were commissioned to do this work and it contains detailed modelling, pathway modelling and then a series of route maps identifying carbon emission reductions that are necessary to achieve net zero by 2050. So for the Oxfordshire wide target and it has milestones at 2025, 2030 and 2040. It also establishes an Oxfordshire wide carbon budget of the maximum emissions that can be admitted to maintain this pathway. 
and then it proposes 14 joint actions to address the county's direct emissions, so scope one and two, and then also some aspects of scope three emissions. The development of the action plan and the engagement with the consultants has been led by Oxfordshire County Council um, with input from the Future Oxfordshire Partnerships Environment Advisory Group Officer Group, of which Dom and I both sit on. This group will continue to work together to support the delivery of the joint actions with active discussions already underway on options about external funding for the different um, work areas. So the action plan proposes 14 actions um, which are on the screen now and these are actions that have been identified as being best delivered through joint working between the Oxfordshire local authorities and also other key stakeholders. The future Oxfordshire partnership maintains overall ownership of the joint action plan and the advisory groups of the FOP are sponsors of the broad work areas and they will provide oversight and guidance on the development and the progress of the work over the next few years. In terms of reporting, it is proposed that, proposed that a six monthly update on activities against the priority actions, which I'll talk about in a minute, will be taken to the relevant FOP advisory groups um, and progress every six months and then progress against the emission reduction targets and the action plan progress using the KPIs that each action have will be reported to the FOP on an annual basis. The review and reporting process will be coordinated by dedicated officer resource within the EAG officer group. Officers from both Vale and South Oxfordshire will be closely involved in the delivery of the route map and action plan. It does align really closely with our own climate action plans. And so the delivery of the two will both go hand in hand to help us achieve our net zero goals. So my final slide um, there, we have to recognise that our resource constraints and so we have there have been it's been decided that some of the actions need to be prioritized and delivered in a more phased approach so the environment advisory group officer group were asked to prioritize the 14 actions and identify those that should be prioritized in the short term and so these five that are on the screen now are the ones that have been um, decided to be prioritized and then it sh also shows the organization that will be taking the lead on that action I'm just going to run through these really quickly, give a little bit of background. The first is buildings decarbonisation or retrofitting. This is already something that is being prioritised by pretty much every council in Oxfordshire. And we discussed it at the last SIAC meeting. But at the moment, ambition is being held by, back by delivery capacity. But there is likely to be future funding from national government, which we can apply for. And there are already multiple funding innovative innovative funding schemes that would benefit from joint working and knowledge sharing across the stakeholders in Oxfordshire and Oxlep also already have a work stream on skills taking place at a county level which will also tie into this work the second priority action is local area energy planning this has been prioritized because uh, grid constraints are recognised as an immediate strategic issue to clean growth and cross boundary work is likely to be very important to address this it also builds on the work of local energy Oxfordshire project, Project LEO. This is hopefully have potential follow on funding for this project, which is being announced in March 2023. So maybe it has already. I'm not sure. And this will um, include opportunities to work more closely with the di distribution network operators to provide the evidence for their investment in the networks, which will be crucial to transitioning to low carbon energy systems. We had an initial stakeholder workshop on this topic a few weeks ago, and we will continue to be heavily involved. The third priority action is electric vehicle infrastructure. This was prioritised because there is already an Oxfordshire electric vehicle infrastructure strategy, which was adopted in 2021, and the successful park and charge scheme has already been rolled out across the county. We also have funding relatively secure funding for now and over the next few years through the local EV infrastructure Levi scheme. Oxfordshire has been allocated an amount of money and the districts will receive a portion of this and the details of this are currently being ironed out at the moment. The fourth um, priority is land based carbon sequestration model. This uh, there's already joint working on this between the future Oxfordshire partnership and the local nature partnership on, on an investment model for land based sequestration in Oxfordshire. We aim to be heavily involved in this work and the Innovate UK net zero fast followers bid that Sally was talking about earlier 
should provide, hopefully, if we are successful, provide a resource to help develop this. And then finally, the um, is um, action on green finance, um, in particular exploring green bonds. And this was prioritised purely because it is identifying new funding sources and models is going to be absolutely critical to supporting delivery of the net zero target. Just to finish off, a just quick note about resourcing. So the joint action plan will draw on resources from across the partnership and stakeholders. At present, the resourcing for each action has not necessarily been determined and the publication of this document does not place any financial commitments on South and Vale. It's likely that it will come from a combination of sources with, with input from all the councils, but this is still to be decided. Um, for example, if we are successful in that net zero fast followers bid, that will be part of it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for um, presenting that to us, Jesse. Um, did read the paper, as I'm sure all the other members did, but it's good to have the points summarised um, ahead of our discussion, but also for any uh, member of the public who is also listening. Um, so myself, I yeah, I thought it was a really good report. And what I really liked about it was so I could see a lot of things where we're already doing bits and bobs on it. So it wasn't like, oh, no, this is some big surprise that we've got lots of stuff to do. We know we've got a big job to do, but it's good to see some alignment with things we're already doing. But my, the best bit for me was seeing um, having a roadmap so we can see if we're trying to get to net zero 2050, although this council has um, further ambitions than that what we need to hit and how we can monitor ourselves because it's the only way that we'll get there so those would be my overall comments um are there any um comments or any particular points that members of this committee wish to raise um ahead of this going to the cabinet briefing in april yes councillor de la harp uh, thank you, Chair. Yeah, the, the document was very encouraging to read, very exciting. Um, however, I think I, I, I kept thinking, how's this going to work? Are we going to need an army of people who will be trained to install solar panels and retrofitting in, uh, insulation? It's, and who, who are those people? And if I think about it, they're probably all in primary school at the moment. Um, I think there's a role for our education um, educations to be guiding children towards this career because I think it's a great career opportunity. Um, but I, I, I kind of think most kids are, are steered towards different kind of careers. Um, so I thought what was missing in the report was an involvement with um, education yeah okay yeah so um yeah i see what you're saying and um yeah i think there was a mention about having to um get more uh, upskilling our, our workforce um although as you describe it it's a future workforce um dominic did you have anything to um add to that yeah, I mean, one of the key areas of work identified in the, the action plan is the need to uh, address the green skills gap. So there is a recognised problem with um, capacity, um, both e everywhere from the, the current capacity in terms of suppliers and their ability to deliver solar panels and air source heat pumps and so on, right through to people who specify um, some retrofit works through to deliverers um, and that's a, that's a big area of work now there is a whole work stream dedicated to that looking at um, the, the, the the sort of supply and skills gap and working with or looking to work with organizations such as of Abingdon Whitney College because it's going to be a a big um, sort of upskilling of, of of the workforce and and a different workforce, frankly, because it's going to require a lot of people who are um, currently not working in in the sort of more more manual industries to, to 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 change to this sort of work. So there is a big issue there. Um, it's 
and 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 it, it is a recognised problem. So it's it's very much something that the the action plan is looking to to try and influence. But uh, it clearly it's it's an area of work that the county, with its educational hat on, has a um, quite a part to play. Um, and and we will look to work with all of the partners to see what we can do to help them achieve those game goals. Thank you. Thank mm. you, Dominic. Um, Councillor Grant. Yes, uh, apologies if you can hear a screaming baby in the background from the other room. Um, so I it's kind of the same line, really. So on the retrofitting, um, I'm just not convinced that it's going to be that achievable because um, we obviously had a retrofitting um, group um, with, uh, jointly with South Oxfordshire and the scale of the problem is huge, both from the skills thing and just the number of houses. Um, I had a, for example, I, I'll just even use myself as an example, because um, I live in an old uh, listed leaky 300 year old building and I had one of these cosy home Oxfordshire surveys done and it will cost, it's cost, they reckon this before the inflation, £33,000 to get up to a grade C. And we're estimating that we're going to get 100% up to uh, efficiency B. And I think, are we being overly optimistic on the retrofitting front that we're going to be able to do that? And perhaps we should be um, a bit more realistic about that, that we may not be able to get every single house up to that that level uh, in the long time. Yes, perhaps 90% of houses, but there are always going to be some that are, are, are just too too tricky. Uh, and I wonder if there's a role instead for something, thing, switch, still switching away from gas heating um, to, for example, uh, so uh, the trouble is you can't put a normal heat pump into a, a leaky building because it just won't provide enough temp uh, heat. Um, but there are such things as high temperature heat pumps and i don't know quite why we don't discuss those there may be some issue with them that i don't know but i've seen them advertised so i'm just wondering um are they a realistic option in the future and that perhaps we should be considering that as an option maybe we won't be able to get everything to grade b but if we switch them to heat pumps we're still um doing something but that, but then we would then have to presumably offset more um anyway I guess that's my my question is really are we being overly optimistic on the whole retro sitting thing entirely and should we be set a more realistic um, timeline on, and goal on that one? Okay, yeah, Dominic, do you have a response? Um, I'm not going to be able to answer all your questions, David. <laughs> um, it, it, so the 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 action plan is following on from the original PASCO report. Now, the original PASCO report set a high level of ambition for decarbonising in Oxfordshire. And all the action plan is doing is taking that high level of ambition, which was described in the original PASCO report, and showing what carbon budgets we need to achieve and how you would equate that to the number of properties and the levels to which they would need to be retrofitted. So. To some extent, it, this report is following on from the previous PASCO work, which is where that ambition level was set. So whether or not we're being over ambitious, it, it is the whole plan is based around a very ambitious scenario for reaching net zero by 2050. Um, I think it's called the Oxfordshire leading the way scenario. And that's that's really why. This is following the same trajectory, trying to demonstrate how, what you need to do to achieve that. Yeah. Yeah, OK. And I would, yeah, and I would also say that if we've set these, what the report does is show us what we need to do to hit the target. So I would rather that be clear and then and then we attempt to do that and then try and fix the problems along the way when we can't do that. Um, Councillor Grant, did you want to come back on that or have you got? Yeah, I guess I guess the point I'm getting at is, are there other ways to achieve the targets? So if we set our, if we say this is the way we're going to have to achieve it, but that way isn't isn't achievable, mm -hmm. then we're not going to achieve that, and then we won't have done enough work on, for example, um, the sequestration um, by you know looking at that route because we won't have accounted for the the shortfall which we're going to have if we 
if we still hit a very ambitious but more realistic target. That's that's my concern is that we then don't do enough in other areas to to because this all in, I guess this all works if we achieve every single one in every single area, then we get to what we need to do. Mm. But in reality, we will have to overachieve in some and probably underachieve in others. Um, and by if we set the bar too high on ones where we don't think we can achieve it, we risk not um, aim, setting it high enough in other areas to compensate. Yeah. OK, yeah, no, I see what you're saying. And I think that's a comment that we could put forward to the cabinet that basically we have concerns about that particular area. Um, is there a way that we can, um, when we're looking at our route to, to net zero, that we can sort of, um, I guess, some kind of buffer on some of the other measures like that can be a recommendation that this this um, committee makes, I think. Dominic? I was just wondering, because uh, the, the action plan is meant to be for the next three to five years, and it's the designed to be a living document which is regularly mm -hmm. reviewed. Now, clearly, if we're not in anywhere near achieving some of these carbon budgets which it's setting out, then there will have to be a review process and reprioritization and look to see where if, there's, if another area is doing better than expected then maybe more effort goes into that so i think that sort of review and reprioritization is to an extent um built into the strategy but um, i take your point david i think it it is an ambitious strategy by nature and because we have to be to meet these you know our climate goals um so this is the reality of, of you know the current the current approaches with the current technology and technology moves on, maybe we will need to look at other options as time goes on. Thank you. I'll move on to uh, Councillor Weber, your question. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Hayley. Um, this is really a, a piece of information I, I wondered if you could help me with because um, the elephant in the room is actually building regulations and we're expecting to do all these things uh, encouraging builders to do to do these things and yet builders on the whole are very reluctant to to do this and do we have any information yet on whether we've got some firm strong building regs to persuade them that they have to put in uh, air source heat pumps or solar panels or EV chargers etc or, or do we not know yet? I don't know. Uh, Jesse, do you happen to know when they're going to be updated? No, I, I can find out. We can have a look yeah. and see if we can find out. We, we can. Uh, we'll talk to our colleagues in the planning team and, and um, we can come back with a with an answer if if, if we know any <laughs> yeah. any idea of dates when these things are going to happen. Yeah, thank you very much, because it is obviously the real problem until these people are prepared to work with us. Um, it's going to be a massive problem, isn't it? OK, thank you. So I think I saw in the report and I'm yeah it must be that because that's that's what I've been reading about and I don't think I read it somewhere else about um the future home standard which comes in 2025 that's um good. so that's the first uh thing that the um builders have to follow um and then the ambitions increase after that and then the report talked about passive house and then passive house plus or premium or something um yeah, so it talks about that, but yeah, I don't know how set those are and whether actually to achieve what we would need to achieve, whether they need to come forward um, is what wasn't clear to me. Yes, what, well, sorry, sorry, oh, Jesse. What has been uh, clarified is that planning authorities can continue to set higher standards than building regulations above the future home standards in future. So pl our planning colleagues can set higher standards through the joint local plan than they set out in building regulations, even when the future home standards has been introduced, I think. And and when, it, when they set these higher targets, does that mean that they have to, the builder has to follow those? That would be up to the uh, planning teams to enforce. <laughs> Good luck. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed. Indeed. Um, Councillor Grant. Yeah, that's an interesting point, Jesse. I've seen that before, and I think it's one that we should push harder on I think personally also I'm 
be there to do so, but uh, I'll leave that one with everyone that is going to be around longer. Um, so uh, on page uh, 82 of the agenda pack, page 70 of the report, there's a, a district heat network fuel mix thing. And it's assuming that we've um, got, we've installed natural gas uh, district heat networks, as far as I can tell. I don't understand why we would install natural gas district heat pumps, uh, sorry, not heat pumps, district heating um, at all, um, because it's natural gas is not a way of de decarbonising. Uh, you, you can't really de decarbonise natural gas at all, um, unless we can switch it to hydrogen at some point in the future. But um, it just seems like a, a, we shouldn't be installing those kind of district heating. If we're going to install district heating, it should be um, heat pumps i would say so i wonder that why other committee members think about that because a heat pump I, I mean a natural gas one might make it reduce the amount of heat uh, energy that we're using in the short term but doesn't get us towards decarbonization because it's still a carbon way of uh heating basically yeah so yeah on, i read that part as well and the way i took it was that yeah, district heating is more efficient, so you would waste less carbon. Um, but you're right, it can't be decarbonised. Um, but whether you can more easily, I don't know if this is true, more easily upgrade the district heating, then you can encourage everybody to um, remove their gas boilers and replace them. That's that's kind of how I took it. But I guess, yeah, if you're going to implement a strategy, why start with that? Why start from that point? Start from a point of... Um, uh, better than that basically i don't know if the officers have um comments on that it's my understanding that a district heating thing could be more up easily upgraded to be low carbon but i don't think it would be um saying that we should implement new gas district heatings at this point but i'm not sure mm. so that again could be a comment that we put forward um to our um to the cabinet because, and that thing that would be we could control that locally I imagine sort of any planning application that comes forward because it'd be quite a major one right if there's going to have district heating in it then we could have our own I think we could have our own policy or say on what we would want to see on that so we could yeah intervene at that point but make that clear to cabinet at the moment okay um councillor weber did you have another question no sorry i should have reduced put my hand down apologies That's okay not a problem um okay i can't see any more um hands um i just seen if i had any further questions this is this feels like a silly question but i read in the report about um the energy super hub oxford project and i actually don't know what that is Does, can somebody tell us what the energy super hub oxford project is <laughs> i don't know uh, unfortunately not um no that's okay <laughs> <laughs> i assume then it's not it's not our council area then it must be just like the city because it's I, it's I on the roadmap and there's all these bits yeah yeah, yeah okay yeah. that makes sense i will endeavour to look into it and I can uh, inform fellow members of it um, yeah that's due to be finished this year is what it says in the report anyway so I'm sure it's very good um, okay so yeah I so one of my questions then is that I was looking at the um, actions and thank you Jesse for um, summarising those in the presentation and um, all of them, most of them have proposed um, leads and s like most of them aren't Vail. Um, but yeah, one of the ones I saw said, uh, so this is action three, uh, they have a collective purchasing approach that supports the widespread deployment of rooftop solar on existing buildings. And it proposes the city council as a lead. But is there a reason that that wouldn't just be like every district? council because obviously if it's just city then it's only on in the area of the city rather than the rural districts or is it deliberately chosen as that because um 
I don't know, the density of buildings or something. So the proposal is that um, ZCOP, which is the Boxford City Zero Carbon Programme, is to be integrated more into the county-wide approach. So the ZCOP sprint groups, which are the ones taking actions like this forward, will be opened up to the districts and the county to get involved with. And they've actually already started looking at this um, collective purchasing approach. So it's already one of their work streams. So effectively, we're going to be invited into the tent to work with them on these schemes. So um, it's recognising the fact that the city are a little way ahead of us in, uh -huh. in a few areas. And but the city have agreed effectively to work as part of a county, a collective county unit to try and share that best practice and roll it out across the county. Because um, essentially, I think the, the size of the market matters when you're talking about centralised purchasing, because you're able to get much better deals with suppliers if you've got a bigger area. So I think that's the, yeah. the reasoning behind that. Yeah, yeah, exactly. OK, yeah, that that explains that. And uh, another question, if I if I may, which is um, most of the actions talk about um, convening a working group. So it feels like there's going to be a lot of working groups for a lot of different things, which I imagine that the main people sitting on those will be yourselves. Do we have a sense of, you know, do we have enough people internally to handle that and or will we expecting to, as part of the working groups, get some outside expertise? But, you know, you guys are obviously extremely competent, but I'm just thinking about time and maybe expertise in really sort of specific areas. Or is that sort of to be determined? Well, one of the reasons I think that um, the Environmental Action Group Officer Group uh, were asked to look at prioritising the 14 actions was because there was a recognition that we have a limited staff capacity to mm -hmm. input into these things. So it was really trying to focus down on those five areas of work that integrate already into what we're doing that would have the least impact on our capacity, additional capacity requirements. Now, going forward, I think in the longer term, yes, the answer is there will have to be more investment in this area. We can't get away from that. If we're going to decarbonise across the board yeah, um, uh, to, to try and limit global warming, we have to invest and that has to include people um, that are driving this. So whilst it makes no um, sort of promises around that, it, it it's implicit that there will need to be further investment. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. OK. Yeah, that makes sense about the priority actions now. Yeah, because clearly you wouldn't be able, you would just be all of you sitting in working groups if you were doing it for all of them on day one. So, yeah, starting with the most important ones. OK, that's clear. OK, in that case, I can't see any further um, raised hands for this item. So I'm going to move on to the uh, tenth agenda item, which is the Climate Action Plan performance report for quarter three. I think most of you will be um, familiar, but for anybody, in case anybody is um, listening to this meeting or watching it back, then the Climate Action Plan is, as suggested in the title, our action plan for the Vale of White Horse District Council to um, lay out uh, our our plan, our strategy for how we're going to do, um, how we're going to impact climate change um, in in the things that we can influence. And it's split into themes and there are clear timelines and, and line items for each action. And so the point of the performance report is that we can monitor ourselves against those actions to make sure that we um, stay on track and that we're delivering um, what we uh, intend to deliver. And so the agenda item we're looking at now is the performance for quarter three. So the, the previous quarter to the quarter that we're in now. And um, yeah, so are there any um, 
any questions that people have about some of the items, any further, it might be that we might have to take those away because the uh, appropriate cabinet leads may not be here for that, but it's um, right to uh, deep dive into any particular issues here. And the other thing that you can do um, right now is if you see any particular things that you would like to deep dive into later, then it's something we can take forward either into a future task and finish group or into another meeting. OK, then we'll start with Councillor Grant. Hi, yeah, I'm looking at the theme one on page seven, uh, which I think it's page 103 of the agenda pack. Um, yeah. And it's talking uh, about about uh, in our reports um, that we've always have a climate section that there have um, been a review to make sure these have happened. Um, just from my own experience of seeing sort of in scrutiny committees and seeing a lot of reports and the climate sections are filled out but not necessarily entirely helpfully or rigorous, not, perhaps not in a way that's actually achieving much. It's kind of um, a lot of the time it, there's a, a couple of sentences there to say that it's not really relevant to whatever the the report is and sometimes it is that relevant and sometimes it isn't relevant um, but I, I, I'm not sure that we're getting the best use out of them um, at the moment basically uh, and there's obviously a thing about staff training in the previous agenda item is one of the things that was on now and I'm wondering if this is an opportunity for a bit of uh, additional staff training and getting more out of these rather than just seeing them sort of ticked off. Um, so you're right, David. Um, the the way those things are filled in isn't always uh, that informative. Um, now, what what we've been doing is ensuring that all the reports um, that go through are also sent to us now for a view and a comment. Now, generally speaking. Um, we would review those and if we see any that are perhaps not quite capturing the, the climate implications of a project or a, or a proposal then we would raise that with the relevant team and, and suggest uh, some additional wording or work with them to work out what, what, what can be done about that. But what does underlie that is the level of understanding of the officers who are producing the report. So um, the basic training is what we've rolled up. We had the presentation at the last SEAC meeting of our basic training. There is another action following on from that, looking at more specific training for certain service areas. And that's what we're going to be beginning to focus on now. But we're obviously having to take this in a sequential way so that we've got the resource to do it properly. So if I mean, it'd be helpful if if for if we received any feedback of any specific areas perhaps where you think maybe the information wasn't as good as it could have been and we can look at those and think about whether there might be some training that we could look to either deliver or find a provider for to help those teams understand a bit more about that so yeah that's noted thank you great thank you um for the question david and for the for the response so yeah members of this committee if you are sitting on other committees and, and notice something in the papers there then Dominic has given you permission to um, email him and uh, <laughs> point it out so thank you um, Councillor Weber. Thank you Kayleigh. Um, I was looking on page 125 the the one red um, traffic mark that's in the report the rest are either yellow and green uh, and I see it's on uh, EV charging points um, I just happened to be listening to a programme the other day about EV charging points and how people are being very frustrated that there aren't enough around the country, uh, particularly the fast ones, uh, and that they are therefore not buying electric cars. Um, the other piece of slightly worrying news I heard was that um, some garages are now stopping supplying electric cars because they're saying that even the second hand ones which have been reduced to sort of 8300 something like a nissan leaf um, are not selling uh, people are not buying them um, although we're hearing that people love their electric cars once they buy them so there is a problem here um, and it worries me that um, if we are putting our ev charging uh, points as a red 
as a red uh, marker, that suggests that it's not suggest that we we are not interested in, in adding any more EV charges at the moment. I wonder if that's right and whether we ought to just look a little deeper, bearing in mind, you know, people traveling are actually being put off by actually traveling in an EV car because they don't they say words like their cues against the uh, with um, on a fast charger or they cannot find a fast charger or um, they cannot find any EV chargers in the area where their car runs out. So all this sort of information is 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 sort of piling up. And I'm just wondering whether that needs to be relooked at the, the red red mark. This, this is an action which isn't uh, down to our team to deliver, um, but I think that's something we'd have to take back to um, the relevant team to find out what is being done about it. Now, the, the commentary they've put in here reflects the fact that we put in quite a number of charge points in our car parks, and as yet the uptake hasn't been that great in some of them it's gradually it's on a gradual increase and I think as time goes on clearly that will improve but there is a bit of a chicken and egg isn't there between yeah. installing the points and not making any money which is the commercial decision on the part of those or companies that run them and installing them because people are worried about range anxiety and all that kind of thing so it is a bit of a difficult one I, I think um, some of the work that's been done with the county council on the Levi funding will help this ultimately. Um, I think it's about identifying which of our uh, other uh, premises um, are likely to be suitable for that. But we can take that one away. Um, in fact, we, we will be beginning the Q4 reporting round shortly. So we'll inquire a little bit more as part of that process to find out what's happening on this action. Thank you, Dominic. Thank you. Yeah, I actually wrote a, a comment next to that as well, because I was surprised to see it say that there wasn't substantial demand when um, uh, sales of EVs are increasing and, and there's obviously more now on the road than there ever was. And I, my personal uh, observation as a owner of an EV car is that um, in certain areas the charging infrastructure hasn't increased at the rate of the people buying the cars but I think what's in is interesting issue because this uh, uh, line item is about installing it on our premises so I think like actually the, the charging infrastructure that's needed to address the issues that Catherine mentioned that she's read about wouldn't necessarily be solved by us putting them on our council premises. But um, I'm glad that we've been part of the projects and they are in, our, in a bunch of our car parks at the moment and in, in large numbers as well, which is good because it basically means you can always get a spot. I, I think um, also, Hayley, one extra point is that um, it, it, what I was reading was that people are saying there aren't enough fast chargers. Yeah. And so we may have got chargers, but we may have not got the right ones. I just don't know. Well, I just as someone who owns the car, I disagree because I think where you want the fast ones are not um, when you're shopping in the in the town centres. Because when you shop in a town centre, you want to be there for a few hours. So you don't need a fast one because the fast one only takes half an hour. So I think the fast ones need to be in different locations, which are not necessarily locations that we own land on. Um, would be my, you know, observation just from being one of those people. But, you know, I haven't conducted studies or, or read the things that you've read, so it could be wrong. But um, OK, then the next question, uh, Councillor Grant. Uh, it's not another question, it's just to follow up on that. Uh, I agree with you that the fast charges, there are there is not a good enough infrastructure on that, but it's um, motorways and A roads that you want those on, because when you're travelling to your local shops, you don't need to charge, basically, because you're charging at, at your wire first, you set up, you've got up home or your local um nearest sort of slow charger that you use overnight um and just if you come to farringdon we've got 12 chargers and it's absolutely the right decision that we've gone and done it but the average usage of them is probably about a quarter of a charger being used at any one time um i rarely do see more than one car um in those 12 charging points so i, I can i can see why we don't think there's an imminent need to to put in more um from that perspective it's 
it's, a, it's quite a large proportion of the car part that's already taken up. Uh, but I think it's absolutely the right decision because people need to know that they can use them. But I think we've we've done quite well on that. So yeah, I, I agree with you, um, David, that I think it's what we've got is good. You know, people might look at it and think, oh, they're not being utilised. But wouldn't it be silly if we put in two and then had to put in two next year or two and then two the year after that? Like it just it makes sense to future proof. So, yeah, I think in time we'll be proved right on that one is what is what I believe anyway. And would you, Hayley, would it, is it our business actually to encourage then other areas, not just our area, our veil, what we own? Is it our, is it our business to actually try and encourage them to put charges in, like, for instance, where I live, which is where I, my, my ward, which is the, which is an A road, A415 running through it. And it has a, has a um, garage at the, you know, at one point and no sign of any charges there. So just thinking maybe should we should be trying to encourage them to, to put them yeah and i think that um we do that through our planning policies right it's kind of difficult to um to yeah so you influence where you can and where we have can where we have influence is in planning so for example i've seen it before where um there was one for a garage in, um, in my ward and we said you know put comments in saying whatever they were doing development they were doing can you also put in two EV charge points so I think I think you're right Catherine I think this on this um report it's about specifically about council land yeah. and so what's written there is you know is correct and and we'll take that away yes. but there's there's it's a there's a much bigger story um here yeah um, more a bigger narrative um I can see yeah Councillor Grant more on this or another question <laughs> More on this, because okay. actually I'd, I'd written down a note uh, on the previous um, agenda item and yeah. there was a thing about uh, install, getting a freight um, electric vehicle charging and yeah. actually related to what um, Catherine just said and you just said about it being planning, perhaps we should be making a recommendation um, to the cabinet that as part of the local plan we um, highlight areas that would be suitable for a large um, sort of a service station style electric vehicle charging point both for cars and for uh, lorries. Mm. Yeah yeah I like that. Mm. That sounds good. Okay okay yeah yeah we should recommend that I, yeah and um, at any point when we're involved in any local plan consultation as as any members of the council and even the public are then we can make these suggestions um but yes it'll be formally noted in these minutes um okay are there any um further questions while we're waiting for any more hands i have one about um okay it's in it's page 119 SD10 um, and it says about working with our town and parish councils um, who are developing projects to reduce carbon emissions and in the performance update it says we're having um, town and parish engagement sessions that are held monthly um, and I was wondering and maybe it doesn't have to be now because I've obviously just asked you off the cuff if I could have some more information about what those um, entail because um, obviously Quite clearly in this report, there's just a couple of sentences, but I think it would be interesting to know um, what what that actually um, means. Obviously, great to see that it's a green item and, and it says it's going well, but also how this links to um, on page 134 C11, which talks about quarterly climate focused network meetings for town and parish councils um, to create links between between them, because that one's reported as Amber and said no progress. So I also just wanted to understand the difference between those two things. I can probably help with that one. Um, yeah. So Action SD10 is linked to um, work that the planning service of already been doing and been doing for some years where they hold essentially a surgery on a regular right. basis for town and parish councils and it's specifically relating to planning issues and this provides them with an opportunity to ask questions about our carbon reduction and planning issues related to that so that particular action is 
um, mm. about sort of planning advice. So that's sort of being taken care of, which is why it's green. Um, the other action um, is one that we're looking at um, and we're trying to work out the best way of doing that. Um, yeah. Now, to be frank, the, the action as written is quite resource intensive to deliver mm -hmm. and may or may not deliver what we're looking for. So we're doing some work at the moment with our comms team to scope out the best way that we can deliver that without it taking up all of our officers time, which would then inevitably have impacts on the many other things we're trying to do. So I hope we'll be able to, uh, either next quarter or the one after. So Q1 20, whenever we are, 23, 24. Um, we should see some progress on that. Um, we are working on a uh, on some ideas about how we can best deliver it, frankly, without it um, having impacts on other areas of service delivery. So that's why it's reflected as a as an amber because we're we're a little bit behind on it because yeah. of the resource requirement. Yeah. Okay. And I think I did ask that in a previous meeting as well. So, <laughs> um, and what you said then was what you said is the same both times and it completely makes sense because um we only have a certain amount of resource and it's right that you prioritize the things that have the most impact so you know that's and that's the point of having this report right we can see what, what what's happening so uh, you know that that makes sense but i think that um i don't know what sort of things you're thinking about but if there's a way that you can harness the energy of this group then I'm sure the councillors or the future councillors after the election would also be, I don't know what that looks like, but could be interested. Well, in I that. mean, I can give you a, a, a tiny peek at what we're thinking of. So it, it's not going to be a one size fits all. Um, we want to use our comms team to uh, and, and ourselves to look at the various different ways we can communicate and interact with town and parish councils and community groups, which are also uh, mm -hmm. tied up in that action so some of that will be about potentially face-to-face -face workshops which will be themed some of it will be about targeted communications um, and utilizing existing networks like the um, OLAC the Association of Local Councils and others we're looking at all of these different things as different ways of sort of getting the message out there and, and interacting with organisations. So it's likely to be a, a multifaceted approach, which isn't all reliant on us having mm. to be here to do it. Yeah. Yeah. OK, that sounds good. Thank you. Councillor Weber. Uh, I just wanted to say I oh, I'm just trying to raise it. I can't see it now. There it is. Um, it's on page 34, C7. Uh, promote relevant housing energy efficiency schemes, including grants to residents, landlords, housing associations, etc. I just wanted to say I do think this is a really excellent new website that you've put up there, reduce your energy costs, um, and, and will be hugely, I think, valuable throughout the the um, the veil. So just say that's all I wanted to say. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for that. I'm glad I'm glad you thought you've seen it and you think it's useful. That's mm. The, the, the work that the officers are putting in is having an impact so that's great to hear um right okay i had another one about so if i can get to it um about the dig cut lc whip which is mentioned here so it's op3 page 136 of the report um i happen to be part of the steering group because of my locality. I represent um, residents that live within the Dukot area. Um, but do you think there's a way, is there a way that this group here, the SEAC of Vale, can have more of a, a, a direct role in the LC Whitburn? The fact that I'm on it is just nothing to do with this role, it's because of my locality. So is there a way what in what way can the climate emergency advisory committee have um have an impact on lc whip did or otherwise again um this is a a, a project we're not our team isn't working on yeah. directly so i don't i mean i don't know if there is um any sort of consultative work as part of that um yeah but clearly one way would be through any consultation um, yeah. that's going on. But I, I think this is something, again, we'd need to take back to um, 
the team that are delivering this and see if there is perhaps a way that um, that SEAT can feed into the process. Um, yeah. So that's something we can take away and, 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 and ask that question. Yeah, OK. Yeah, I think that's right. I think that there's a way that we're directly involved or at least asked to be involved. Um, just thinking about what we can do to impact as members of this committee, because see, we hold these meetings and we talk about some stuff, but um, which is good. Um, but we yeah, where we can have like a tangible impact as well. I mean, like you say, it, no, we weren't stopped from doing it because clearly anybody could contribute to the consultation. And in fact, I did. But um, yeah, so on that, then the most recent round of consultation is closed, but there will be another one. So perhaps something I could also do uh, as chair or if there is a future chair um, after me that they could, um, be, you know, email members forward um, links to consultations and so on. Maybe that's a role for the chair. OK, um, Councillor Weber. Oh, sorry, it's I keep forgetting to put it down. Oh, yeah, that's that's absolutely okay. fine. OK, then um, as I can't see any other hands, then um, I'll just say on on the report, I think it's really good to see the performance report that, you know, that the public can see that we can talk about it, get updates on on things. So I think it is a really good report. And I especially like I think this has been a sort of iterative process of improving the report as well, because um, I really like the sections at the beginning that are like a bit of a narrative to give an overview rather than just having to read the line items. Um, makes it a bit more digestible, certainly for members of the public, for example. Yeah. So I think that's really good. And, and one thing which I think is an update this time, correct me if I'm wrong, is where there's grayed out, grayed out actions for where we are not where we're, they're not being taken forward because something else has changed. So that's really good to see because I think there was a bit of um, confusion in previous performance reports where it was red, which made it look like we were doing something wrong when really we weren't moving forward with it anymore for a very good reason. So that's a good improvement as well. That That's something um, we're looking to, to continue with because there are some actions that we're no longer pursuing and there are some actions that have now been delivered so we're going to have a similar approach we'll still have the narrative to say what when it was delivered yeah. so people can look back at the previous reports um but obviously that reduces the reporting burden on the teams as well so it's quite it works both ways <laughs> yeah exactly exactly Great. OK, then the final agenda item is um, future items. So we've already mentioned a couple um, during the meeting itself, um, which I think will have been noted. Are there any other future items that members of this committee want to bring to either a future meeting or a separate task and finish group? Okay, I can't see I can't see any hands. That's OK. So we'll take the ones that have been mentioned during the meeting. And of course, um, you can email me if you think of something that we need to bring forward to a future meeting and we can um, I can discuss it with the officers also with the cabinet member to see um, whether we can do that. So there is also that option. OK, in that case, then we have come to the end of the agenda and the end of the meeting. So just Thank you, everybody, for, for taking part. And maybe I will see you um, post May election. So take care, everybody. OK, thank you. Thank, thank you. Bye bye. Bye.